what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Good morning, and we welcome you to this morning's service. We hope that you 
enjoy and are blessed by the time that, that um, you spend with us this morning. We hope that the Lord speaks to you in both as we sing and share in both spoken word, and we hope that you enjoy now as the choir shares a special with you. Thank you, choir, and how true that song is. We were created to be worshipers, to praise the Lord. In fact, the Bible says if we don't praise the Lord, the rocks will cry out. Uh, and that's why we're here today, to praise 
the Lord. And it is so good to see everybody today, and uh, I'm blessed to look out and see lots of guests. It's so good to have guests in the house of the Lord. So thank you so much for choosing to set aside this time to, to be with us in worship. Well, I'm going to invite you to stand as, um, as we go to God's Word and we just read from His Word. We're reading through the book of First Thessalonians on Sunday mornings, and we are in First Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 9. The Bible says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, we work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how like a father with his children we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And may that be the, the personal ambition of our lives, that we each walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, because he deserves nothing less. Well, this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer, no doubt you have, uh, I'm sure, your own concerns and burdens, and we want to take a few moments just to give those concerns to the Lord, but I do want to mention a couple things specifically this morning. First of all, we, we want to pray for Jeff and Susan Braswell. Uh, Jeff's stepdad, Mr. Buddy Reese, is not doing well, and so after our worship time, Jeff and Susan are going to head out to be with the family. So I just ask us to pray for Jeff and Susan. And then also, um, Mike and Gail Tatum are, are with Mike's uh, mother, Miss Jeanette. They're in southeast over in Dothan. Miss Jeanette was not doing well this morning, and so they had to carry her by ambulance uh, to the hospital. And so we want to, to pray for Miss Jeanette. And then also... Uh, I ask you to pray for Michelle this morning. I will later on expound a little bit more, uh, but uh, for now I just ask that you pray uh, for Michelle. So with that, let's, let's take our concerns to the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much uh, for this good day. We thank you that you created us uh, to, to be people of praise and worship. And Lord, we thank you that in salvation, you put a new song in our hearts. We are the redeemed. And that's why we're here today, to worship you. Not only through song, but in a few moments, through, through the preaching of your word, as we learn about the awesome God that you are. Lord, we, we know that as believers in Christ, this is not our home. We are just pilgrims passing through. But Lord, until you call us home, we live in a, a fallen world, and we see the evidence all around us. And this morning, we, we want to pray for those who are, who are facing challenges and difficulties. Specifically, I, I pray for Jeff and Susan and Mr. Buddy. Lord Jesus, I, I pray for, for mercy to be with them. Lord, I also pray for Gail and Mike uh, with Miss Jeanette and Lord, we, we pray for, for healing for Miss Jeanette, for the doctors to have wisdom. And, and Lord, I lift up Michelle to you, and I, and I pray, Father, for, for her healing as well. And, and, and Lord, other, other things that we just all struggle with. Lord, above everything, as we were challenged in your word, to, to be people who walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. We thank you that not only do you save us by your grace, by your grace, you allow us uh, just a brief time down here to live for you. And, and may we be people who, who are focused on the mission that you've given us. Grow us, Father, as, as we draw closer to you. And, and Lord, this morning, maybe there is one or two here and they've never trusted Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. I pray, Holy Spirit, as only you can that you would open their eyes to their need for Jesus and that they would call upon the name of the Lord and be saved this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you. Continue to be honored in, in our worship to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain 
could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night in through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows Amen. Well, while our children are making their way to Children's Church, would you please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 8, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 9 this morning, Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 9, as we 
study verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark. We are at the halfway point of the Gospel of Mark. It's hard to believe that we're already halfway uh, through. We've been learning so many things about our Lord. Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. I, I want to start out by just reading the text for us. The Bible says, In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave to them his, to, to his disciples and set before the pe- to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd, and they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them, and they ate and were satisfied and they took up the broken pieces left over seven baskets full and there were about four thousand people and he sent them away all right so here you are you're sitting there and somebody's talking to you and they begin to tell you a a story it's an exciting story it's a it's a it's a funny story it's a sweet story But the only problem is you've heard the same story several times from that person already. What do you do in that that moment? You've had that experience. In fact, no no raising of hands. There's been times I've told you the same story. And you were sitting there saying, Preacher, we've already heard this story. Maybe that's what you were thinking as we were reading this story. I mean, didn't we just read this same story just a few chapters back in chapter 6 where Jesus fed a large crowd of people miraculously? I, I mean, is Mark here, is he confused? Maybe he's got the, the beginning signs of, of dementia. I mean, Mark wasn't one of the original disciples, so he wasn't there, so... Maybe he, you know, he's just confused. Or maybe those ancient scribes, as they were copying the original manuscripts, maybe they, maybe they messed up and they accidentally recorded the same story twice. Well, that is not what has happened. This is actually a completely different story than the feeding of the 5,000. This story is recorded, obviously, in Mark's gospel, but it's also recorded in Matthew's gospel as well. Now, this is how we know that this is not the same story. You see, there are some who want to say that this is actually just the same story, that Mark's just repeating, uh, he's just telling the same story more than once to emphasize some kind of theological truth. But as we compare the two stories, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, we see that there are some stark differences that clearly show that these are two different events. First of all, you don't have to have a theological seminary degree to see there is the difference in the number of people who were fed. One, there's 5,000. Today, we see there's 4,000. Something else that, that stands out is when Jesus fed the 5,000, the the crowd were predominantly Jews. Here, Jesus is in a, a Gentile area, so most of the crowd on this day were mostly Gentiles. These were not Jews. With the feeding of the 5,000, the, the, the crowd had just been with Jesus for one day, but here we find that the crowd had been with Jesus listening to his teaching for three 
days. Feeding of 5,000, there was five loaves and two fish, whereas here we see there were seven loaves and a few fish. When he fed the 5,000, it was probably sometime near the Passover because the grass was green, which would have been in the, the springtime, whereas here it just says that he has the people sit on the ground. There is no grass, so this was at least several months after uh, the, the, the springtime when the summer heat had already withered the grass. So it's a totally different time of, of the year. Something else that, that stands out, you probably noticed that with the feeding of the 5,000, how many baskets full of leftovers were there? Twelve. That's significant because it was predominantly a Jewish crowd in each one of those baskets representing the 12 tribes of, of Israel. Whereas here it just says that there were seven large baskets left over. And now here's the kicker. This is what seals the deal. If you fast forward to chapter 8 verses 19 through 20, Jesus, as he is um, teaching the disciples, he clearly says in verses 19 through 20 that these were two separate events. So I just want to start out by helping us to understand that there's two different, these are two totally different stories. But in these stories, we once again are given further evidence of who Jesus Christ is. He is the Son of God. Jesus wasn't just a good teacher. He, he wasn't, uh, you know, a martyr that just died a martyr's death. He was God in flesh who came as the Lamb of God in order to be our Redeemer. It's been said that repetition is the mother of all learning, right? Most of us have to hear something more than one time before you get the point. That's why I tell you some stories more than once, by the way. I haven't lost my mind. Jesus understood, clearly we, we see the disciples were dense. Let's not be too hard on the disciples, because if we're honest, we, we're all the same. I, people say, well, if I had been there and if I had seen the miracles, I would have reacted differently. No, you wouldn't have. You would have been just like the disciples. We're all, if we're, if we're believers today, we're all in the process of growing in our faith. And, and that's what Jesus is doing with his disciples. He's preparing them to be the, the men who would, he would use to establish the early church after he, he left. And so he's, he, is, he is teaching them once again another lesson that would further develop their, their faith. He is the bread of life come down from heaven who is available for both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles, you and I. Yes, he came first for the Jews, but praise God we see that he has compassion on the Gentiles as well. That right there is worth coming to church for. Is that he offers grace. He, he offers us as himself as the bread of life to us to receive as well. So as we look at this story, a story we have not learned about yet, there's four lessons that I want to point out as we take the text and we break it down. First of all, in verses 1 through 3, we see Jesus feels our needs. We, we see the, the hungry crowd here. Again, this is, uh, this is a, a Gentile region. We know that if you go back up into verse 31, Jesus is in the region of the Decapolis. That was a Gentile uh, region. And verse 1 of chapter 8 says that this great crowd, they had gathered, they had nothing to eat, and they had been, according to verse 2, they had been with Jesus for, for three days. This crowd, they had heard about the miracles of Jesus. Many of them had come, probably hoping to see a miracle. They were fascinated by, by his miracles, but apparently they were hungry for his words. Because they stayed with him, listening to him teaching for three days. They, they stayed even though Jesus preached well past 12 o'clock. This was a hungry crowd. They're sitting there, they're hungering for Jesus' teaching. And, and then you learn about the compassionate Savior 
In Mark's gospel, Jesus says personally, I have compassion on them. Now, with the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus had compassion on them because he said they were like sheep without a shepherd. He felt their need because they were lacking spiritually. Here, he literally feels their need. He has compassion for them because they lacked food. Again, they had been with him three days. The, the little food that they had brought by this point is, is, is gone. And, and he doesn't want them to, to, to try to travel home with empty stomachs. The text tells us that some of them had traveled great distances, and so he has compassion. This word compassion in the Greek, it's a word that, that refers to the, the inner being of a person. He, he literally, his insides hurt for these people because they were in, they were in need. And, and, and again, I point out that Jesus has compassion not only for Jews, but these are, these are Gentiles. None of these people were deserving of his compassion. But, but what Jesus is doing here is he's giving us a glimpse of his ultimate plan and mission for his kingdom that would be made up of people from all the nations. You know what? When we get to heaven, man, what a, what a glorious place that's going to be when there are going to be people from every tongue and tribe, every ethnicity represented, falling at the feet of Jesus. Isn't that going to be a glorious day? And, and, and so this hungry crowd experiences the compassion of Jesus. And, 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 and we know from this that Jesus not only knows our needs, he senses our needs, literally he feels our needs. He has compassion for us. He knows where you're at today. He, he feels your, your needs today. And praise God he has compassion on the undeserving. I wonder today, what is your need? What is, what is the need that you have today? Maybe it's a, it's a physical need. It's a financial need. Maybe you, you come today and, and you have a deep emotional need. On the outside, you're smiling but on the inside, you're, you're tore up and you have this great need for emotional healing. Or maybe there's a spiritual need in your life. Jesus knows your, your needs today. He, he feels your needs and therefore he is available and he is willing to meet your need in his time and in his way. And that's very important that he has compassion on us and he he meets our needs in his timing and in his way. We don't put Jesus in a box. That's a dangerous thing to do. So first, we, we see Jesus feels our needs. Number two, the second lesson we, we get from this text comes in verses 4 through the first part of verse 6, and we see that Jesus multiplies our resources. Jesus multiplies our resources. Now, let's look at the disciples Verse 4, they come to Jesus with a question. The question is, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? Jesus, there are no McDonald's. There's no Publix anywhere. We're out in the middle of the desert. Now, the question is, did these men, I mean, did they really have bad memory? I mean, had they forgotten completely forgotten about the miracle that Jesus performed when he fed the 5,000 which really when you include the women and children amounted about 20,000 people I mean did they really have a problem with bad memory no they had a problem with bad faith it's not that they had forgotten but but they're questioning whether or not Jesus is going to do it again these guys are spiritually dull. They were certainly the, the dullest knives in the, in the drawer. <laughs> um, or maybe they're even thinking, well, yeah, we, we know that he, we remember when he fed the 5,000 Jews, but these are Gentiles. Is, would Jesus do that for the Gentiles? Again, we have to be careful because how many times, I, I cannot speak for you, 
But how many times when I face a crisis in my life, I just throw out everything that God has done in my life in the way of faithfulness. I completely throw it out the door, and I find myself beginning to panic in the face of a new crisis. And that's where the disciples are, are at. And so what, how does Jesus respond? Well, basically, he says this. What do you have? What are your resources? Give them to me. Put them in my hands. And so he, he takes the, the bread. He sits the, the crowd on the ground. He takes the fish. The text says that he gives thanks twice. And, and then he... He takes that, now this is not loaves of bread, like you and I think of a loaf of bread. This would be like a flat bread, and he, and he breaks it, but then it just keeps on multiplying. I would love to, to have seen that. Maybe when we get to heaven, uh, God's going to allow us to have a, you know, he's going to have a recording somehow. We're going to be able to look with our own eyes. Won't that be glorious? We don't know. But, but Jesus here, through this response, through this miracle, he, he's teaching the disciples and he's teaching you and I that we are inadequate to meet our needs. We can't fix our problems. But when we put them in his hands, he'll multiply our limited resources and he will, he will provide the answers and the solutions to our problems and difficulties again in his way and in his timing because little is much when God is in it so so Jesus feels our needs he multiplies our resources but number three verse six the latter part of verse six into verse seven we see Jesus uses our hands Jesus uses our hands we we see that Jesus provided the miracle now I just want to pause here for just a moment I I just have to kind of share one of my my struggles i love good bread uh, in fact if i go to to longhorns i could i could eat three or four loaves of those bread all by myself i love good bread i've had good bread i mean i've had several trips over to europe and europe makes the best bread in fact on the mission trip i went to romania me and danny watson literally every night we both shared about a loaf of bread nice warm bread i mean i'm just being honest but as good as that bread is the best bread i have ever tasted doesn't compare to what this bread tasted like for you seafood lovers out there you've never had seafood that is as good as this fish can you imagine what that bread and those fish tasted like as the master provides this this undeniable miracle and, and, and the people eat. He provided the miracle, but don't miss this. The disciples served the meal. Now, if Jesus could miraculously multiply the loaves and the fish, he could have just instantaneously made a full meal appear in the laps of the people. But that's not what he chooses to do. Instead, he involved the hands of his disciples. And, and he was teaching these men to... To, as they, they serve, to, to trust his provision, to provide what they needed to, to serve, because they would, again, they would become the, the future soul-feeding messengers of the gospel, the, the bread of life. And, and, and I hope that today you find it an absolute blessing to be one of his servants, to know that he uses your hands... To, to serve. I mean, how privileged we are to be able to serve the Lord. And I hope that you, that you don't take that for granted. I mean, I, I, certainly if you just think about your favorite president, whichever president that, that was, can you imagine if that president called you up and said, listen, I want you to be my right-hand man for a day. Would you be willing to do that? Oh, yeah. You'd be excited enthusiastic we have been given by God's grace to be servants of the most high God he uses our hands 
to accomplish His purposes. Number four, and finally, we see in the, in the rest of the text, verses 8 through 9, Jesus satisfies our hearts. Jesus satisfies our heart. What we see here written over these verses is satisfaction. With Jesus, there is a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Their appetites, these people's appetites, their desire for food was completely satisfied. After they ate, they needed nothing else. What he supplied them with that meal completely satisfied them. I remember as a teenage boy, it was amazing. I, my mom would cook an unbelievable meal. I would sit down and I would eat that meal. And then 30 minutes later, I'd be sneaking back into the kitchen looking for something else to eat. When Jesus feeds the soul, it's satisfied. He, he provided completely, totally, with an abundance left over, right? The, the, the text says here that seven baskets were full of leftovers. Now, the Greek word for basket here is different than the Greek word with the feeding of the 5,000. Feeding of the 5,000, those baskets would have been much smaller. Here, this is, this is like a human-sized basket. One of those that you, you, you find um, at uh, one of these places that you ladies like to shop at and you get these home, you know, where you, those big baskets, you put all the blankets in and everything. That's the kind of basket. In fact, it's the same word that was used in Acts chapter 9 that, that they used, the basket they used to put the Apostle Paul in to lower him off of the, the wall. And, and so in the end, Jesus miraculously provides and he more than satisfies the appetites the text says of 4,000 men, not including the women and children. So again, we're, we're talking about possibly 15,000 people here. And so no wonder Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus satisfies our hearts. All right, so now that we've learned these, these four important lessons about Jesus, let's, let's take this text and let's apply it to our own lives today. Number one, I think that what we can, we can get from this is, number one, share Jesus' heart. Share Jesus' heart. We, we have to have the heart of Jesus. What was the heart of Jesus? He had a heart of compassion. And we must see people, we must view people with that same kind of heart. We have to have a heart for people. This, this means feeling compassion not only to people that we can relate to and people that, we're, that are similar to us and, are, and that we're comfortable with and our friends and our families, but people out there on the fringes of society. The ones that are hurting. The ones that have wrecked their lives because of sin. But we must share the heart of Jesus and we have to view those people with, with the lenses of, of compassion. Feeling, literally feeling pain for, for their, their needs and their, their struggles. I, I wonder, is that true of you? Do you have compassion for people? And that's important to, to ask ourselves because it's very easy to become self-righteous, right? And we see somebody who's down in life. And we say, well, you know, they, they had it coming to them. They're, they're getting what they deserve. And certainly sin has consequences. And we don't want to justify sin. And there's never any excuse for sin. But we have to look at people with compassion because but by the grace of God. There goes I. So share Jesus' heart. Number two, trust Jesus' hands. Trust Jesus' hands to provide your needs, to multiply your resources. Put it all into the hands of Jesus. Here you are, you're facing some kind of situation, and you have very little strength. You say, how can I do this? You give him the little strength that you have, you put it into his hands. 
Give him the little faith that you have. Trust his hands with your needs. What is your need this morning? Give it to Jesus. Put it in his hands. Let him take care of your problems because here is what I know. He is faithful. He is faithful. And he, and, and he wants us. This is, this is what the Lord wants for each of us. He wants us to get to the end of ourselves. He wants us to get to that place where we say, Lord, this is absolutely beyond me. I cannot handle this. I cannot meet this need. I cannot fix this problem. And when we get to that place, we're in a good place. Because that's when we finally begin to look up to him. And that's when he works. And that's when he grows us. And ultimately, that's when he gets the greatest glory. When we come to the end of ourselves because we have nothing to boast in, right? When he meets some miraculous need. And he does it in a way that we never would have imagined. Then, then he, gets, he gets all the glory. And this is, this is true and important for us individually, but this is very important for us corporately as a church. How many times do churches, they have a situation? Maybe it's they're at a place and they're outgrowing their facilities, okay? And, and they begin to do some investigating and they find it's going to be X amount of dollars. You know what most Baptists do? We go to the budget. Now, I'm not saying that we, we throw discretion and wisdom out the door. Certainly, we want to seek his, his wisdom. But most of the time, we look at our budget, we say, okay, what can we afford, right? We look at the little that we have compared to the, to the situation, and most of the time, you know what we do? Nothing. We just keep on going. Because we're like the disciples. And we say, is the Lord able to do it? Will he do it? So, so we need to trust Jesus' hands. Number three, from this we learn serve Jesus' message. You know, it's interesting, the, the, the bread and the fish that the disciples received from the Lord, none of it belonged to them. So they had no right to, to, to claim it as their own. They're, they had no right to, to keep it. The only fitting response for these men is, as the Lord gave it to them, and, I, and again, I just, I'm just imagining in my head, Jesus breaks the bread and in each one of the disciples comes and the bread just keeps multiplying. The, the fish keep multiplying, never running out. Jesus puts it in their hands, not for them to hoard it, not for them to keep it, but to dispense it out, to minister it to the, to the needs of, of the people. And, and, and so the challenge that we have as followers of Christ, as believers, is that we are to serve his message. We are to serve the bread of life to, to the world. And we do that first and foremost by serving the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ. That all humanity, we all have the same problem. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've missed the mark and there was nothing that we could do to fix our sin problem. No amount of good works. No amount of morality. No amount of reading your Bible or coming to church or getting baptized every Sunday until your skin wrinkles off and falls off. None of that matters in regards to salvation. But Jesus came in order to live a perfect, sinless life as the Son of God. And as he hung on that cross, he was dying in our place, paying our sin debt, taking the condemnation that we deserve, so that all who tr put their faith in Jesus Christ shall be saved. It's a very simple message, and it is the message that the, the world needs to hear. It is the message that right here in Donaldsonville, Georgia, in the heart of the Bible Belt, Donaldsonville, Georgia needs to hear this message because there's a lot of very religious people in Donaldsonville and if you were to ask them, tell me what is the gospel, they would look at you like a calf looking at a new gate, absolutely clueless. 
and, and so we are to serve serve the gospel message but then we 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 serve his message by by serving people's needs in the name of jesus and and when you allow the lord to to use your hands in ministry when you serve somebody else guess who gets the greatest blessing you do i mean think about these men they served I personally think they got the bigger blessing because not only did they, they serve a meal, but they get possibly the leftovers. And, and the greatest blessing is not living a life that is completely self-focused. And we can all be tempted to do that. You know, you just say, well, I, I'm going to take everything that God's given me. I'm going to take my life and I'm going to focus on what I want to do. But people who live for others and they serve the king they have the greatest joy. And, and so I, I hope that this morning, as a follower of Christ, you find yourself that you are in a place where you are serving. You're not a spectator. Because as the, the proverb says, it's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And then fourthly and finally, fourth application is simply this. Receive Jesus' provision. Why do you want to see receive Jesus, he, he has provided his life for us as a ransom for many. He is the way of salvation. He is the truth, the life. Only Jesus can satisfy your greatest need. I, I wondered this morning, what is it in your life that you're looking to, to scratch that itch, to give you satisfaction? To give you contentment. Could it be money? Yeah. If I, just, if I just had a little bit more money. I was reading this week about how apparently the PGA, they're going to pay Tiger Woods $100 million. I guess in some kind of royalties because he represents them. $100 million. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, we, we, we say, that, man, that'd be awesome to get $100 million. What does that mean to a guy like Tiger Woods who is worth billions of dollars? But yet, by all evidence, I don't know his heart, but by the evidence of his life, no amount of money is giving him the contentment that only Jesus can give. Maybe for you, you're looking to your career. You're looking to your job. Maybe it's your spouse. Listen, if you have a spouse that God has blessed you with, that's a blessing. But you do an injustice to your spouse if you look to your spouse to give you something that only Jesus Christ can give you. Because we are fallen people. And we will let our spouses down. Maybe it's, it's success. Maybe it's stuff. You know, we just get more, more stuff. I was joking with a couple yesterday at Hardy's, and they were moving, and he said, I'm just amazed at how much stuff we've accumulated. Why is it that we don't want to let go of our stuff? Because we think we need it, right? But we can't get enough stuff. Maybe it's a hobby that you have. It's that, that drive for that hobby, and that's what you're looking for, for satisfaction. Maybe it's some kind of substance. But why? Why would we settle for stale moldy bread that the world has to offer that will never satisfy when we could feast on the wonderful bread of life in Jesus. Psalm 34, verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Are you satisfied this morning? Do you have contentment in your heart this morning? You say, I don't, but I'm looking for it. Well, the good news is you can be satisfied by receiving Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. But if you don't do that, you'll never be satisfied. Turn to Christ. Feast on the bread of life. He is good. He will never let you down. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank you again.